Hello, everyone. This is Richard from Modern Healthware. We're going to start a new three month trial with NMN, and we will take epigenetic age tests at the start and in the end of the trial to see the progress. HKG Epitherapeutics has kindly agreed to sponsor our epigenetic age test for this trial. HKG Epitherapeutics has provided a limited offer until September the 30th of a 16% discount for two or more kits. This is a good opportunity for anyone who would like to do a similar trial with before and after tests. Please find the details in the description. In this video, we talked to Professor Ziff about the epigenetic age test that the company uses and what informed their decisions on the parameters of those tests. Professor Ziff is a James McGill Professor of Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the McGill University, where he also holds a GlaxoSmithKline Canadian Institute of Health Research Chair in Pharmacology. He is one of the pioneers in the field of epigenetics. His lab has proposed three decades ago that DNA methylation is a prime therapeutic target in cancer and other diseases, and has postulated and provided the first set of evidence that the social environment early in life can alter DNA methylation, launching the emerging field of social epigenetics. This was the subject of his 2016 TED Talk on how early life experiences is written into DNA. He is also the founder and CEO of HK Epitherapeutics, a Hong Kong company dedicated to making early detection of cancer using DNA methylation widely available. And with that, let me start the interview. So good morning. Hello, Professor Ziff. So you are, professor, you are a professor at McGill University where you run a lab and also the founder of Hong Kong Epitherapeutics. So welcome back to Modern Health Span and thank you so much for joining us today. So, Professor Ziff, what I'd like to, when we spoke before, we talked a little bit about uh, whether aging is programmed or it's acute or not, you know, and, and I think the, the thought was that it was mostly programmed. So I'd just like to kind of go back to that again. So do you think that aging is, is programmed or not? And, you know, when, once we've reached sexual maturity, does this program continue or is it right, really an accumulation of damage? I think evidence suggests that it is programmed uh, because of two, re two reasons. First, it is highly consistent in a species. So the lifespan of a species is pre-programmed, right? The dog will never live 100 years. Humans usually live up to 100 years. Average lifespan stay the same. Um, and so it's clear that it's written in our genome how long you live. Hmm. And what we learned is the way it's written in the genome is by the pace that the epigenetic clock is ticking. So all organisms have epigenetic clocks, but they move much faster in a mouse than in a human. Mm. And smaller organisms have slower clocks. And this is probably encoded in the genome, but executed by the epigenetic clock. Right. Interesting. Thank you. So can we talk about Hong Kong epithe Epitherapeutics. So you you uh, created Hong Kong, you founded Hong Kong Epitherapeutics. So when you were developing the tests that you did, right, the, the particular age test, could you talk about what, what, what were kind of the design goals? Right. So our company is focusing on epigenetic tests mm. for early detection of disease and for maintenance of health. You know, the uh, general motto of my company is to harness the power of epigenetics uh, to prevent disease. And by looking at the different epigenetic markers in our, in our body, we can uh, get warning signs for disease. So, of course, one of the most common warning sign is that the epigenetic clock is ticking fast. Hmm. And um, so we know that humans have an epigenetic clock and actually... We have many, many sides of the genome that react to time and to age. And so uh, when we are born, they have a certain state of methylation. And as we go through life, it changes. Uh, however, uh, we were looking for two things in our tests. And that's common for all our tests. They have to be robust. They have to be high throughput. So amenable to next generation, multiplex next generation sequencing. And they have to derive from easy biological samples. 
So first we wanted a saliva test. It's the easiest way to communicate, uh, to essentially uh, communicate with consumers directly because you don't require blood. Blood even with pricking kits is still an invasive procedure. Um, and so we looked for the markers that work in saliva. The second thing was it has to be simple uh, because our idea was the more positions you add, the more complicated it is, the more expensive it gets, uh, the more prone to error it is. And really, uh, you know, our techniques are not perfect. So uh, they are error prone. And, um, and the more measures you take, the more chances to make mistakes you have. So we examined the genome and how it changes. Uh, so we examined 450,000 positions in the genome. We tried to find those positions that have the highest correlation uh, with, uh, with chronic age. That means they move from birth to death and, um, and they change, assuming that their change indicates something is happening in our body. The other thing is, if they are perfectly aligned with chrono age, they're useless, right? Because we can take our ID and know our chrono age, uh, except for forensic purposes. If you, uh, you, know, you have a crime scene and you want to uh, detect the age of the criminal, that might be useful, but we were not interested in that. We were interested in some level of noise because that noise is the noise of life, right? So even though we all live an average of 82 years, nobody actually lives 82 years, right? So we are all either shorter or longer than the average. And so a good clock should correlate highly with age, but should not call it perfectly with age. And these were the criteria. So criteria one has to be a very simple biological source. Criteria two, it has to be a robust biochemical test. And criteria number three, uh, that it has to correlate very highly with age, but not perfectly with age. Right. So some, some uh, companies are talking about, you know, they look at like 850,000 sites or something like this. Right. Um, would, would that add extra accuracy or, I mean, is there any value in so many sites? Right. I mean, overfitting is always a danger. So in statistics, uh, you pay a high penalty if your model has many variables. Hmm. Of course, uh, the more variables you use, it's easier to fit it to, the, uh, to your model. But the question is how accurately it reflects the real situation. And, and so the jury is not out yet, whether you know, putting 850,000 sites is an advantage or disadvantage. And also, um, we don't know whether the noise in so many sites uh, you know, is, could be related to so many other things that can happen. And, um, and I would not say at this stage of science that you know, the shorter, uh, clocks are better than the longer, or the longer better than the, than the shorter. Of course, uh, artificial intelligence loves tons of data and mm -hmm. loves to you know fit tons of data. Uh, however, how well it's going to do, you know, not as a model but as a, in the real life, it's not clear yet. So the jury's not out yet. I think all the different clocks have some value, and and the only way to know. What is the differential value of each of those? You know, uh, will require very extensive clinical tests, and that uh, might take some time. And um, and so, I think as more people use it, as more data is generated, uh, we will find out the specific uses of each test. My philosophy is: more simple the model, the more predictive it is. Um, but there are other philosophies as well, and I think mm. it hasn't been fully tested. Right, and uh, yeah, I, I'm just not sure how wh whether the extra accuracy, even if it existed, would would how much value it would provide is the other right. thing. We don't, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Don't know. and so you know, I think uh, people are going to use different clocks based on different tastes. Not only right. scientists have different tastes; I think people have different tastes. Right. And uh, eventually, 
we will learn. I mean, this is a completely new approach. You know, we're like measuring blood pressure 200 years ago. So, you know, it takes a while for us to learn how to take full advantage of that information. Definitely right. important about information. It's definitely related to our health. But how to use it accurately will require a lot of work and experience. Mm. Right, which kind of brings me to the next. So you talked about this a little bit, which is um, deciding on the, the, the area, the uh, particular sites that you were going to use. Right. And how those match with chronological age, right? And right. so th they don't exactly match. So w can you talk about what you did use to train um, the clocks and how related do we think they are to all cause mortality? And um, so how should we think about the result that we get from the epi age test? Right, so we, d we did train them only against chronological age. Hmm. Uh, we didn't train them against lifespan. And, and so they, they are more a measure of, uh, of what happens to you through, throughout life. We don't know if they predict death. Um, however, for example, we tested them on recently, and we published a paper just last week uh, on uh, see it, people, older people who are infected with CMV versus people who are not infected with CMV, cytomegalovirus, virus, which mm. is a virus that commonly infects people, but some people have uh, persistent infections and others not. And there was a big difference in age between these two groups using our IPH clock, suggesting that it does measure, um, you know, aging by other criteria that we know uh, by viral infection. Also, people with HIV uh, will have a different, a much older age with our clock. In addition, we uh, we found that uh, people with Down syndrome uh, are 15 years older by our clock than uh, control. So our clock does nicely measure other indices of uh, of life shortening. So uh, we haven't measured because we didn't have the information on these people. Uh, they are they were all living people, so we don't know when they will die. But uh, and we didn't have the information, the follow up. You know, some, some studies do have that information that they can do that. So, um, you know, but just looking at the data, looking at the fact that it does correlate quite beautifully with, with age suggests that this is something that moves with your age and uh, correlation is, is very high, you know, it's, it's like 0.8 something. And so uh, it, is a, it is a good measure of how fast you're moving, at least with this biological age. And it is the highest correlated position in the genome to age. So it, it, it correlates much better than other sites to age. And the other clock combine this, you know, this or other sites that correlate with age with sites that correlate less well with age. But the combination, you know, the more variable you put into an equation like this, you will get a higher correlation. Simple statistics. The question is how reflective this model is. So if you overfit the model, of course, if you include the whole genome, it will correlate perfectly, but it will only correlate with this cohort. You do, you try it again, it won't. So, you know, there's a certain number of variables that you add more, you're actually damaging your model, not helping it. So, right. Uh, yes, I, I had a look at that paper and it would actually be uh, good to talk about that because the age difference was like five years, I, I yeah. think. Which yeah. was which is quite significant. Um, right. For this people. is older people, right? And and you know, as I said, you know, HIV we see the same. We see Down syndrome. We didn't publish it, but we see the same. And um, you know, whether we look at these regions in public data or whether, whether we look at with our own tests, we get the mm. same. So mm. I think the, this this test does measure something very important about your health. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.